This conference will now be recorded. And I was going to, you took away one of my notices uh, later, but thank you for that, Kate. Uh, so we'll do a more formal um, sort of welcome and introduction here in a second, but I just quickly wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Brad Calvert. I'm the Director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, at Dr. Cog, uh, the member regional uh, council of governments. Uh, thank you all for making some time today. I know everybody's busy uh, and it doesn't uh, help that we're in a holiday week as well, but this felt like one of those things if we didn't schedule it as soon as possible, we might lose two whole weeks uh, to bring uh, this fine group of folks together. So we thought it important to really just sort of sort of throw schedule caution uh, to the wind and, and to bring this uh, initial group uh, together. So again, thank you all uh, for joining us all on short notice. Uh, again, ideally we'd probably be doing this in person, but the world we live in now is uh, the Brady Bunch uh, virtual meeting world. So we'll do our best to make sure all the technology works out uh, to our advantage today. Uh, so with that, I'll maybe go to the next slide. And Kate, if you want to sort of step them through kind of a few housekeeping notes for today's virtual conversation. Sure. Um, I'm sure many of you have used GoToMeeting by now, but just as a brief refresher, um, it is meant to be a more collaborative tool. So you all have the capability to mute and unmute yourselves using um, the button highlighted on the screen. Uh, please default to muting yourselves throughout the presentation just to reduce background noise until we um, reach a Q&A portion, um, which there will be several throughout the presentation. If you have a question, you can enter it in the chat box at any point. Um, and we will be monitoring that. We will also be using an application for polling called Mentimeter throughout the presentation. So you can go to the website menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com on your smartphone or in a separate browser window and enter the code here uh, to use this tool when prompted. And I'll also enter that into the chat box um, just to make sure that you all have access to it. I think that's all the housekeeping I have. So, get started. Uh, so again, just a quick uh, welcome uh, for uh, everyone again. Brad Calvert with the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Uh, we'll, I'll have a couple of co-presenters today as well, and we'll mention them in a second. They can obviously introduce themselves uh, when their uh, slide uh, comes up. Uh, but as you can see on the screen, and ho hopefully everybody can hear me relatively well, uh, in January, uh, we actually convened a group of stakeholders at the Dr. Cog uh, offices at 1001 17th Street. Uh, I know the world of in-person meetings feels like a very long time ago, but I promise you that did happen. And hopefully many of you were able to uh, attend that. Um, also mentioned, uh, while we had the conversation in January, really kind of kick off this regional collaboration uh, conversation, uh, we also followed up that meeting uh, with a post roundtable uh, survey, which will be alluded to and a couple of slides that you'll see a little bit later. And the other thing that I will mention um, that I can't recall if we told the group in January, but after the conversation in January, uh, Megan Lane, who you'll hear from uh, in a little bit, uh, and I gave a quick briefing to city and county managers uh, from, a, from around the Denver region to talk a little bit about this emerging collaborative and to, to gather their sort of initial support uh, for that work. And that conversation went uh, well as well. And they were sort of very interested in hearing more about this uh, conversation uh, as it emerges. And so as you can see on the slide, today is kind of a, a, an ask for help, uh, the best kind. Uh, we're looking to take uh, the next step uh, in creating a shared vision for regional collaboration as we explore funding to advance our efforts to enhance regional waste infrastructure, support local economic recovery and protect our environment. So we're very much sort of kicking off today's conversation, but it's something that we intend uh, to have not only for the next few months, uh, but for the next few years and, and, and beyond as well. So, Kate, next slide, please. Uh, so, again, so I'm Brad Calvert. Uh, I'm going to kind of do the intro and the outro, uh, but you'll hear from fo some folks uh, in between as well. Um, you're going to hear from, from, from Megan as well as from Teresa, who has been sort of working closely with, with myself and, and Kate uh, for my team on sort of a small group. You may hear uh, as well from Jonathan Wachtell. Uh, who is a sort of a co-conspirator uh, uh, in the city of Lakewood. Um, Jonathan's largely sort of doing moderation, moderating role and trying to keep up with, with the chat, but not a surprise if you hear Jonathan's voice uh, at some point as well today. Um, our very, we're very much hoping to have folks out of here by like 3.30 or so today. We think we can cover most of the content and stand up a few conversations uh, during that time. Uh, you heard the announcement, but I will 
uh, add to folks that maybe weren't on the call when it started, but this is being recorded. Uh, so just know that as you're uh, making your comments known. Uh, we had several folks that were interested in being able to join today that just simply couldn't make uh, this time work. So we offered to, to ultimately record and make it available for uh, uh, future viewing uh, as well. So Kate, next slide. So I know that there are a fair number of people of, uh, so you, you, I forgot this slide. Uh, so this uh, is, again, folks you'll probably hear from uh, today. Uh, we are simply co-convening. Uh, we do not see ourselves as sort of the, the only group uh, that should be having this conversation. In fact, that's a big part of the ask today is to try to bring uh, other partners and stakeholders to the table uh, over the next few months. So thanks to, to Golden Lakewood, Denver, and, and Dr. Cog for hosting today's uh, conversation. Next slide. And as Kate mentioned, we have lots of polling uh, to keep you engaged. Check in who's in the room. Make sure you're asleep, not paying attention. Uh, uh, as she mentioned, you can uh, ultimately enter uh, the, the polling information either on your uh, smartphone uh, using mt.com and the, and the code or from your browser. But Kate, if you have any other instructions you think is important for the group to know, let them know. Otherwise, I think the polling should be pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, looks like we're getting some answers coming in. So if you if the tool is um, not working for anybody, uh, maybe just write a note in the chat box and um, I can help you out. And Kate, I'll defer to you when you think it's time to uh, close the poll and, and move on. I uh, also just want to note there's a couple people in the um, chat box that looks like the polling isn't working, but we have some somebody from Longmont, Town of Erie, another Denver, um, Boulder, and Commerce City. Thank you. Yes, please feel free to use the chat box if you're feeling a bit disenfranchised with your voting. That's a, always an option. And yep, I closed the poll on that one. So um, next question is, what was the last piece of trash you produced? I wonder if that's an uneaten box of raisins or an, em an empty box of raisins. That was mine. They were uh, they were consumed. Yes, I love my raisins. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close voting on this one. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll, I didn't want to sort of belabor the point about who Dr. Cog is and what we do as an organization, because I know there are folks on the call that probably uh, work with us quite frequently, but others uh, maybe know the name or the acronym, but maybe don't know much else about Dr. Cog, but as sort of the host for today, I thought a little bit of level setting uh, was important uh, in today's conversation. Um, I don't really want to do a, a deep dive, uh, so trust me, I'm very much skimming uh, the surface, but if you hear something in today's remarks, uh, that you want to reach out and talk a little bit more uh, about sort of what goes on at Dr. Cog. I'm happy to be a resource 
uh, for you. So really, I just wanted to provide kind of a, some high level information about basic structure uh, and roles. And then I'm going to sort of give two um, examples about how Dr. Cog uh, supports uh, two very different uh, collaboratives, um, one very mature and one emerging, just to kind of give you a sense of, of uh, what happens um, at Dr. Cog. So this sort of speaking of the slide that's up on your screen, uh, we obviously view ourselves as a regional organization. Uh, you can't call yourself uh, a regional council and not, and not think that way. One thing that is actually pretty unique uh, about Dr. Cog, even compared to peer agencies from around the nation, is that our board structure includes every local government in the Denver region. Uh, that's pretty unusual. In most circumstances, you're dealing with kind of a representative uh, group, but when our board meets, and that's what that photo uh, on the slide is, um, it's showing elected officials from uh, around the Denver region uh, coming together to collabor collaboratively assess, better understand, and pursue strategies uh, to address uh, regional uh, challenges. Just to kind of give you a sense about um, how seriously Dr. Cog takes uh, collaboration, we're actually in the final days of an annual collaboration assessment. So we reach out to our board every single year and ask them how do they feel the collaborative is working, uh, collect that feedback, and ultimately change course uh, if that course needs to be uh, changed. So obviously something we're very uh, interested in supporting uh, from the elected official level all the way to staff uh, level as well. Next slide, please. Uh, I feel like everyone sort of has some obligation to put up kind of their mission and vision statement. Uh, when it applies, um, I'll leave it up to, to you to read if, if, if you'd like. Uh, but really, I, I really want to use it as a prompt just to mention uh, that Dr. Cog exists um, as, an, as an organization um, to do regional planning. Uh, we sort of date back to the mid 50s and regional leaders coming together uh, at that point in time to recognize that it was better to plan together uh, than to plan alone. Uh, so just that's just sort of baked into um, our DNA. And even though we are one of the oldest council of governments uh, in the country, uh, it's important to note they will remain committed to exploring new ways and roles that allow us to better serve our member governments and the Denver region more broadly. Next slide, please. I worry about explaining this virtually, but I'll do my best. Uh, the thing that I probably want to draw your eye to are the kind of multicolored shapes uh, on the right, right hand uh, part of the slide. Uh, those are kind of our formal roles and authorities. Um, that largely exist uh, because they appear and are named somewhere in statute, uh, whether that is federal or state. Um, we have federal and state uh, statu uh, statutes that ultimately uh, establish these roles, uh, Regional Planning Commission, Metropolitan Planning Organization, and Area Agency on Aging, uh, that formally give us sort of the authority or the expectations that are assigned with that role. Uh, the first one, that Regional Planning Commission being kind of in the growth and development uh, side of things, if you remember that from the previous slide, uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, on Transportation and Area Agency on Aging, as you can imagine, uh, focused on um, aging uh, issues as well. Uh, so in many ways, our sort of, again, our authority, our roles um, are, are in some ways uh, gifted to us uh, by statutes um, at the federal and state level, uh, but that doesn't mean that we aren't always looking for, again, other opportunities to figure out how to support uh, the great work of our, of our member governments. Go to the next slide. So as I, as I noted, um, you know, administering programmatic functions that are spelled out in statutes, only kind of one thing uh, that we do and how we engage on issues. Uh, this, this slide is showing you a few examples of, of, uh, of other roles. Uh, we very frequently play the role of convener, much like we're doing today. Uh, so one example is we are convening a group of stakeholders uh, currently focused on the role of technology in our region's mobility future. Uh, we, are, we are frequently partners in larger uh, regional efforts, uh, so we are founding partner of a collaborative and nonprofit uh, focused on uh, creating equitable access to our region's natural amenities through the Metro Denver Nature Alliance, and then we frequently also are involved in sort of building capacity. So um, the example that you see on the slide is, is our Citizens Academy, uh, which is actually a program that we took over from a uh, nonprofit called the Transit Alliance that Sunset in a few years ago, so since 2018, uh, we've been working to give residents across the region more tools to engage in and within uh, their communities. Next slide, please. As I mentioned um, sort of earlier, uh, I really kind of wanted to just hit two 
sort of collaboratives uh, that we're actively supporting in the moment. And again, largely to sort of just be illustrative uh, in, in, in describing the way that we support this work, uh, in part because you know I laid out that mission statement um, earlier. That's very much a mission statement of the board of directors. Um, we oftentimes as staff find ourselves playing slightly different roles, and one of those uh, is really supporting uh, collaboratives from, from around the region. Uh, so one example is um, sort of regional data. Uh, so we work on behalf of typically 50 or so uh, partners to secure and acquire um, regional, uh, large regional data sets to inform both regional and uh, local initiatives. Um, this is something that we've been doing uh, since 2002. Um, ultimately, what we're doing is we're taking uh, data needed to pursue local work and making it, making it regional in scale uh, to bring those cost savings to individual local governments that are looking uh, to turn uh, that data into useful information um, in their work. And we make sure that those specifications as defined are met uh, when we actually have a vendor in place to produce them. We have been doing this uh, type of work since 2002. So clearly something that's been kind of in the works uh, for quite a bit of time. Next slide, please. And then to sort of um, counterbalance the sort of mature version of the collaborative, I wanted to sort of change gears in terms of topic, as well as one that's, that's much more sort of in the emerging role. Uh, Dr. Cog uh, received funding from uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, specifically their Innovation Center, uh, I don't know, probably two or three years ago. Uh, and it's really focused on maybe that last bullet is the best descriptor. Uh, Dr. Cog is serving uh, as what's called the bridge organization, to where we are working with both sort of clinical uh, health systems as well as community-based partners uh, that are working to address health-related social needs. So that could be housing, transportation, uh, utility assistance, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and that role is ultimately sort of myriad in its, in its approach. Uh, we are building sort of data models and data supports, uh, ultimately creating new systems and healthcare systems, uh, ha having navigators on site to help navigate uh, patients toward, uh, to those community-based uh, partners, and we're also working with a series of, of folks to co-design um, interventions uh, to ultimately result in better outcomes, and we're going to uh, test, evaluate, and replicate uh, those interventions throughout uh, the region. Uh, next slide, even though I think the next one is probably Megan's slide. With that, I'll turn it over to Megan. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. So we just wanted to spend a few minutes to go over um, what we actually covered at the roundtable back in January, especially since that was quite a long time ago. Um, but my name is Megan Lane. Uh, I work under the Utilities Administration for the City and County of Denver. And kind of as Brad reiterated earlier, um, some of us have just kind of been working together informally the last few months to see if there's some sort of synergy around forming some sort of a waste coalition, so to speak. So that's why you're hearing from me. Next slide, Kate. So at the round table in January, we ha actually had the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, uh, CDPHE, come and present and tell us a little bit about the Integrated Solid Waste Management, uh, Solid Waste and Materials Management Plan uh, that they published back in 2016. And so one of the things that this plan did is that it actually like segmented the parts of the state into different sections. We're actually in the front range section, which is pretty typical. I think people are familiar with that term. But just so you're aware, essentially the front range in this plan is identified as going as far north as about the area of Fort Collins down to about Pueblo. And the purpose of this plan was to identify essentially how the current waste management system is working or frankly not working, and identify needs and recommendations and areas of opportunity to improve our waste system as an entire state. And so this looked at different transfer and disposal infrastructure, um, waste collection systems, and also specifically looked at diversion materials management uh, challenges and opportunities as well. And one of the key recommendations that came out of this plan was to actually encourage communities to explore regionalized options, uh, facilities, infrastructure, and planning as well. Next slide. And so this slide has a lot on it. It goes into the different findings uh, that their consultants essentially identified in terms of challenges um, and areas of opportunity. So I just wanted to highlight a few for you guys. So areas um, that are challenging, you know, we have really low what we call tip fees here in Colorado. It's really inexpensive to landfill waste. We have plenty of landfills and it's a lot harder potentially to get access to compost facility and other 
recycling facilities. Um, there's also some challenges around siting new facilities, especially in the organics realm. Um, some exciting opportunities included regional planning districts, um, municipalities and counties sharing best management practices. Um, this idea around co-locating what we call MRFs or material recovery facilities is essentially where all your recyclables will go to um, to create some sort of synergies and save on cost of recycling and of diverting other material. And just kind of looking at this more of a collaborative model versus people having to go it alone. Next slide. All right, so here is a Mentimeter. So if you guys missed the beginning of the call, you can go to www.menti.com and type in the code 167130 if you want to participate in the poll. So the poll is, what is your community's target diversion rate? And if you don't know it, that's okay. You can just mark unsure. All right, so it looks like we have answers that kind of run the gamut so far. Um, some communities aren't sure. Some municipalities might not have, and county governments might not have made a priority actually to set goals in this area. And then all of us kind of run the gamut of, you know, some goals that are in the lower quartile and then some that are as high as trying to set a zero waste goal, for example. Next slide, Kate. All right, and then if you know this, and once again, if you don't, that's okay. Well, what is your community's estimated actual diversion rate? So diversion rate is what is sent to a recycling facility or compost facility and essentially stays out of the landfill. All right, so it looks like a lot of us are probably in the range of setting a goal um, up to 25%. Some of us, once again, is higher from 50 to 75%, um, and then others are unsure, which makes sense because data in this realm can be really difficult to kind of get a grapple on. Next slide, Kate. So to put that into perspective, as of 2018, Colorado's MSW rate, which means municipal solid waste, which essentially includes your typical materials that you would send into a recycle cart at home, like cans, bottles, paper, etc. Um, and it also includes things like food waste, uh, yard debris, and things like that. So it's what you typically find the waste stream, whether it's generated at your home or what we call the commercial sector, so businesses, multifamily, um, industrial areas, etc. So the, um, the MSW rate is, was 17.2%. And then the total diversion rate, which includes things like scrap metal and construction demolition waste, um, actually goes up quite a bit because it's a lot of heavy material and a lot of scrap and aggregate is recycled. It goes up to 35.4%. And just so you guys are aware, um, the front range MSW rate, rate was 18% that year, which is where we fall. Next slide, Kate. Okay, and so also in this plan, the state decided to set some goals and they decided to set them by region. So the front range is where we live. And when the term greater Colorado is used, that's essentially the rest of the states, so whether it's the Eastern Plains, the Intermountain region, or the Western Slope, that's what greater Colorado is. So for the front range, our 2021 goal, which is a little less than two years away now, about a year and a half, um, is 32%. So we have a lot of growing to do. We're only at 18% as of 2018. Uh, by 2026, we're trying to hit 39%. And by 2036, 51%. And the reason why you see that the front range area has more rigorous targets than the rural or greater Colorado area is because we house more of the state's population. And we also have the benefit of density. So we, it makes the economics a lot easier to move recycled materials around the state and the compost materials as well, compared to more sparsely populated parts of the state. Next slide, Kate. Um, and so in this plan, there are various strategies that are identified. There's actually 12, but we tried to uh, consolidate it down to eight, just so you guys can actually see it in the next poll that we're gonna do. 
But just to summarize them, so different strategies include enhanced education programs, recycling drop-offs, curbside recycling is offered at least every other week, curbside recycling uh, has a fee that's embedded in the rate, where it has a pay as you throw a rate structure, which means you're charged more based on how much trash you generate instead of having to pay additionally for recycling. Um, curbside compost, or sorry, organics, so whether that's yard debris or food scraps. Uh, multifamily commercial recycling incentives or requirements. Uh, commercial composting is available. And then construction demolition incentives or requirements for recycling as well. So use the Mentimeter tool to say what your community has identified or adopted for policies and programs in the waste sphere. And most communities have at least one of these eight. Awesome. So it looks like recycling drop-offs, education, having curbside recycling at least provided or offered every other week is probably the most common. And then it kind of drops down from there. Yard debris actually also looks really high as well. And food scraps. All right. And then if you guys can also identify what your community aspires to adopt, whether it's a policy or program in this next poll as well. Awesome, so not too surprisingly, we're seeing a lot more in kind of the next tier type of options, C&D recovery, commercial composting, multifamily and commercial recycling, yard debris and food scrap collection, embedded fee or a page you throw rate. Next slide, Kate. So taking a look at the diversion rate for 2018, um, and considering that the next target is 32% by 2021, that means the front range will essentially need to recycle an additional 865,000 tons of material and send it to a recycling or compost facility in order to help reach the state's goal. So we definitely have a lot of work to do. <laughs> next slide. So essentially a summary of the plan, you know, the plan is intended to help improve convenience and minimize additional costs um, by increasing participation in recycling composting programs. Uh, it essentially states that we have to look at targeting recovery for organic material in the commercial sector if we actually want to drive diversion. It also tries to create a path forward and provide some recommendations for local governments and communities such as uh, the regional planning like we discussed before and other best management practices. And then CDPHE also has different grant funding for opportunities. One is the RREO grant program, and one is funded through the Front Range Waste Diversion Board or the Forward Board, which Teresa will be talking more about later. Next slide, Kate. So what we tried to do was we tried to figure out how much waste is actually generated in the Dr. Cog region, in our region. And that's difficult to do because there isn't a lot of data regarding that. Some municipalities might track how much waste is diverted in their residential programs. Some communities might have hauler licensing programs, try to get how much is collected in the commercial sector, but there isn't a complete picture for the Dr. Cog region currently. So we provide a low target, which uses the states per pound per person average, and then we used actually Denver's hauler license data to come up with the high end of the range, just to give you guys a sense. So we estimate that between 10 to 15 pounds is generated per person per day in our region. Uh, we also are estimating that about half of that is construction demolition waste, so 4.5 million tons, 
and then another half is MSW or municipal solid waste. So if we just look at MSW on the next slide, we're estimating that up to 75% of the material could be recovered either through recycling or composting. So we have a lot of opportunity in our region to make sure that those materials are captured more than just being put into the landfill. Next slide, Kate. So at our round table in January, once we kind of walked through all this information, we tried to identify differences as different jurisdictions, whether you're a city or a county, and then some things we might have in common. So just to walk through them briefly. So differences, you know, structured waste collection. So some cities actually collect their own waste with their own people, what we call self-hauling. Some might contract it out to a private company. And then others, it's totally open market for residential. Data around waste generation and composition is also really inconsistent. Some of us may have done waste composition studies for our residential programs, but there isn't a lot of data around the commercial and the construction sectors as well. We also have differences when it comes to goals and policies and requirements in this area. And our programs and our guidelines actually vary a bit too. Just because, for example, when we send stuff to our MRFs, our material recovery facilities, there are two different MRFs in, the, in Denver alone, and then Boulder County has a MRF as well. And there's some differences in what materials they'll actually accept. For commonalities, you know, we're working with a lot of the same, sorry, Kate, go back. <laughs> working with a lot of the same private hauling companies. Um, we do utilize a lot of the same facilities, whether it's landfills, recycling facilities, or compost facilities. We face a lot of the same structure, uh, infrastructure and transportation challenges. We really all face the same end market realities. So the markets and the recycling sector and where that material is gonna go, we all face the same challenges. Next slide, Kate. So this is a map of the Dr. Cog region. It's kind of outlined in blue here. And you'll see that we have quite a bit, quite a few landfills, a few recycling facilities, but not very many options for composting which is a challenge, especially when landfill tip fees are low and when landfills are close, it makes the, it very difficult to make the economics work for composting, for example. So for the city of Denver, with including transportation costs and the tip fee for composting, it drives up the cost to about $44 per ton, which makes it really difficult to make those economics work. Next slide, Kate. So essentially after the round table, we had a lot of really good conversations around what the heck should we, are we gonna do? <laughs> we all agree that we face similar challenges and that we have a lot of opportunity, but what should we capitalize on? So after the event in January, we actually sent out a survey and four key things rose to the top. So experience and knowledge sharing was identified as a priority. So essentially for all of us to work together, to discuss local uh, best management practices, policies and programs, and doing some knowledge sharing. Um, standardization, data collection. Like we said, it's really hard to get our hands on good data. So we need to be able to figure out what is our actual baseline as a region. The third is explore regional facilities. So it's determine what sort of regional infrastructure gaps that we face and how can we figure out how to make this more of a system instead of just materials being sent to the landfill, compost or recycling facility. How can materials actually flow through our region the most efficient way possible to help reduce cost? and increased diversion at the same time. And the fourth one was closing the loop locally. So whether it's composting and utilizing that compost locally or glass or other sorts of recycled material, we wanna create closed loop systems to increase uh, effectiveness, but also to increase essentially the uh, number of jobs created locally and be a source of economic development as well. All right, next slide. All right, any questions for me? You guys can also unmute yourselves if you'd like to talk or you can put something in the chat either way. Megan, this is Nancy Ford from Arvada. I have a question. Do we know the timeline on all of our um, landfills when they'll be full? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know all of them. I'm gonna let Teresa speak to her situation, Golden. So. Nancy, we probably share a similar landfill that our haulers are using, the Foothills Landfill. 
And a couple of years ago, they had told us that it had 20 years life left in the landfill. Last year, they told us that it now has 15. So it's moving up pretty quickly. They said that they could get a couple of years extension if we were to remove all of the yard waste and the organics from that, that stream. And um, I have some insight because we just, Arvada just went through a, a vote to approve organized waste hauling. Um, one, of, one of the things that concerns me is that in our constitution, we have the option of choosing our waste hauler. And somehow I think that that has to get out of there. Um, because as long as people have the right to choose their waste hauler, they will continue to choose a waste hauler if they don't like the system that's being offered to them. So I would say that's that's going to be an issue, number one. And then the other issue is, is the composting, because uh, as part of the contract that we negotiated, we have four drop-offs according to our contract. But it was a sticking point for a lot of people, because in Arvada, for example, uh, we have some pretty big yards, as I would imagine Lakewood and maybe even Denver has, I don't know. Um, and, you know, we also have an aging population. And while drop-offs are great for those of us who have trucks and who are younger, um, it, it's not convenient for people. And I think that's going to be the biggest piece with the composting. Um, now, I came originally came from Fort Collins where there was a private contractor up there that uh, Hagemans where you could drop off your compost. It was very well used. Uh, but again, it's still dropping off, not having it picked up. And I think that's going to be the biggest issue as we age as a society is that we've got to come up with some way of getting more pickup composting and yard waste pickup uh, pickups as opposed to dropping off and then i think people are going to do it but i think if you ask people to drop off their yard waste um, a lot of people are not going to do it just because it's inconvenient uh, as an older person they they can't be you know traipsing around with branches and things like that and, um, and, and, and a part of that, too, is the education. How, how do you help people to minimize that waste? Awesome. That's really uh, helpful feedback, I think, Nancy. Thanks for sharing. Any other questions at this point? You guys will have another opportunity as well. But I'll just um, share that uh, Tyler Kessler from Town of Erie um, in the chat box, it said that the Front Range landfill um, will be accepting waste through 2051. So, in answer to that question, so it sounds like they've got quite a lot of space. I'm also supposed to say congratulations, Nancy. I know that was a lot of a lot of work in our beta. Well done. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, thank you. We're uh, four of us are being recalled, uh, so. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, political um, <laughs> difficulties in doing it, but it was definitely worthwhile, and we're excited. That's awesome. Okay, Teresa, I think I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think some of us have met, but uh, just a little intro. Uh, I'm the sustainability manager for the city of Golden. Uh, we've had a, a series of waste goals since about 2007, um, and our, our earliest goals started off with about 25% diversion, but as of last year, uh, we increased and adopted new goals that are about 80% uh, um, diversion, um, and we're trying to do some zero waste in municipal operations and for events. Um, so they're pretty aggressive um, by 2030. Thanks, Kate, for the next slide. And uh, so this grant, so I'm going to talk about why this grant uh, will benefit all of us here, um, no matter what stage you're at. Um, so after uh, Megan had talked a little bit about the solid waste management plan by the state um, and 
in accordance with some new funding that was approved last year, they're presenting this uh, this grant now, um, twenty uh, um, two point five million, um, and for communities that are governments and um, schools and private entities. So these are intended to fund uh, two-year projects um, that will start at the beginning of next year. And um, the minimum funding is 25,000, uh, but the maximum is also $500,000. And um, it all goes toward that, that waste diversion. Uh, the important part about this one is that uh, this application is due by August 10th. So it's coming up. Thanks for the next slide. So we've got the, the challenges that we've talked about. Now we've got the opportunity for funding. Um, and now we need to figure out kind of uh, what an application might look like. Uh, we've, we've talked about this uh, for most of this uh, conversation. And I'm sure you've talked about this in your own communities. Uh, the waste shed is you know, kind of a moving target. Um, a lot of our waste crosses boundaries. Whether your hauler moves in and outside of your your city limits or your community limits. Um, we've got kind of finite uh, lives of our landfills. And um, you know, this one, this graphic is uh, something we use uh, in Golden to talk about where is our waste going to go after the landfill closest to us closes. So Tyler, I'm really glad to hear uh, about the Front Range landfill and um, the other Republic landfill in Commerce City because honestly, um, our prices are going to go up because our transportation costs are are going up um, after our closest one uh, closes. Uh, we've got limited options for MRFs, and um, most of us use uh, commercial hot compost operations that are quite a bit farther away from us, and those transportation costs eat up um, all of our our prices as well. Thanks for the next slide. So. Um, the, the grant talks about uh, different uh, points in our maturity of our programs. And uh, the grant talks about things of as a progression uh, towards zero waste. Um, and for this project, it's totally okay um, that we could be a consortium of communities at various different stages in our in our growth, um, we we kind of just talked with Nancy about um, their attempts to do uh, single hauler and and licensing for that. We've got communities that are on this uh, meeting that are in the very early stages of just setting goals, or they might not even have goals yet. Um, so so we're all kind of on this ladder um, concept where we're at different stages. Um, might be uh, at the bottom looking up or in the mid. Um, part of the ladder or towards the top, um, but our goals are zero waste or approaching zero waste. Thank you. Next slide. So, what kind of community are you? Um, communities that are, up, you know, looking up the ladder uh, are just starting to track data. Um, they're looking to add uh, accessibility towards recycling um, and uh, maybe looking internally. Um, and to just introduce some of these. Uh, they might be single stream type of events like e-waste or fall leaf collections, um, but they're trying to do uh, some basics uh, for providing services to, to their communities. Thank you, next slide. Uh, communities that are kind of climbing in the, you know, in the middle of the rungs, they're looking at pays you throw, uh, maybe a single waste uh, hauler contract, uh, they're looking at some zero waste events. Uh, they might be partnering with other communities on a transfer station for compost, um, or they're adding recycling to multifamily and commercial. Thanks for the next slide. Um, and this is this is also important to communities that are higher up in the ladder, uh, communities that already have some more mature waste diversion programs. Um, data on the region that we'll collect through this grant also helps, can help those communities. You can look at the economics of regional markets and decide what the biggest bang for your buck might be. It can help um, uh, the end markets for the businesses that are in your community, looking at post-consumer waste. Uh, you might want to uh, be looking at expanding household hazardous waste or hard to recycle materials. Um, so this, this this can help data on a regional basis can also help even 
more mature programs. Thank you. So right now we've got a poll. So in thinking about your own community, um, where are you at on this spectrum? Are you kind of in your infancy, starting out? You might have dabbled a little bit. Are you middle, uh, looking to do quite a bit more? Are you a um, more mature program? And we'll take a look. Good deal. So we're starting to see uh, a good amount of communities that are kind of dabbled, got their feet wet, you know, quite a few diversion programs and, and uh, looking to do more. Um, but we also have a lot of communities that are uh, starting out and can benefit from some of this. Uh, but I'm 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 also pleased to see communities that have done quite a bit and uh, might be able to benefit from this data as well. Okay, thanks. We can turn it up. Okay, so why why does anyone you know need data? Um, you know, data gives our municipalities, our counties, language to kind of understand the issues and the challenges. Um, we can't really address what we're not measuring, and all of us, a lot of us have problems with collecting data. We're missing uh, parts of it. We've got gaps in the data. We don't see a complete picture necessarily. Um, we always have some streams that might not be quantified and captured. So we need that generation data. We also need to know where's our material going. Uh, it's kind of a surprise when it goes completely on the opposite end of uh, the front range, uh, depending on the hauler's whim or where the, the end processing facilities are. What kind of system types are around? I know most of us talk to each other when we're talking about um, single haulers or pay-as-you-throw, and we're kind of all trying out uh, and trying different things. Um, and then the gaps, you know, when you're transporting materials 50 miles across uh, the front range, um, there's a big gap there. You know, it might be a MRF, it might be a compost um, transfer uh, facility that's needed to get them to the end processing plants. And then how much do those things cost? Are they going to cost your own municipality? Are they going to cost your residents and businesses? Um, are they going to, um, those costs being passed on by the hauler? And of course, um, you know, education and outreach is all something that we probably all do no matter what stage you're at. Um, and having the data to kind of show in a graphic representation or a visual can really help our, our efforts. Thanks. Uh, we'll go on to the next. So what's in it for you? Like, why should you join this effort? Why, why should you be part of this grant? Um, uh, we want a participation from a lot of communities because <clears throat> we not only think that data can help you decide a path forward, but it can help you avoid uh, other, other steps that you might not even need to do. Um, you know, that might be going straight to curbside service instead of a drop-off location. Uh, that might be learning from other communities that have already kind of done uh, something before, and it can help you kind of leapfrog ahead. So there are plenty of um, also obstacles um, that uh, this data can help you kind of answer questions. Um, uh, I think there's no shortage of residents that ask us, um, you know, we're getting calls from residents, we're getting calls from our city councilors, uh, you know, how much does this cost? What's our diversion rate? Um, what's the most popular thing people need to recycle and how can we meet that demand? Without this data, it's hard to answer those questions. Um, so this, this, this grant, um, we're proposing to help us uh, kind of get some answers to those tough questions. And then what you can use the data for is to help create a vision for your community uh, for, that everyone can kind of rally around. Okay, next slide, please. So we've got um, a short little uh, word, word cloud that we're gonna produce here. So um, you can put in up to three short answers here. Uh, they can be multiple words, but what are your biggest obstacles? Uh, we're kind of all dealing with different uh, challenges right now. Um, what, are, what are some things that your community is dealing with? Um, it can be political, it can be physical, it can be um, uh, you know, people's willingness. Uh, what's, your, what's your latest obstacle that you're dealing with?
Okay. Construction and demolition, political resistance. Oh, the NIMBY attitude. That's a good one. Uh, funding is central to this world word cloud. Um, so we've got a lot of folks with, with funding needs. I suppose if we threw money at it, we could solve everything, right? <laughs> so communication, organics. Price of land, that's a good one for citing some of these activities, right? We're on the, the front range is expensive and um, there's a reason why some of those organics, hot commercial operations are on the plane. Um, laziness, that's a good one. Transportation costs, good deal. Communication capacity, yes, but Political resistance, participation, education, politics, they're all right up there. Very good. Well, we'll have this word cloud uh, available later. And uh, thank you for your, your comments. Sounds good. Well, we can go to the next one. Thank you. So, so again, our opportunity, $2.5 million. Um, we're, we're not looking at um, taking, asking for the whole thing. Uh, we think that this data collection uh, process uh, could be uh, closer to $450,000. Um, and who's most likely to get these grants? Um, they're listed in the RFA. Public and government agencies are at the top. So what we're trying to do here is see if there is willingness to kind of come together as a consortium of local governments who could get some letters of support um, around this, this type of a grant. And um, this is a, a winner. So you don't have a match this year. Maybe you're short on funds. Doesn't matter. You don't have to provide a match. We don't, they're not asking for a match here. So um, this is a fantastic opportunity that doesn't come along. Um, but what we really need is, is your help and your indication of, of willingness to kind of help us out before August 10th. Um, so. So that's that's kind of uh, the grant in a nutshell. And um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Brad to talk a little bit more about um, the grant itself and some of his observ observ observations. <laughs> uh, th thanks, Teresa and, and Megan and, and Jonathan all for chiming in as well as the great questions, uh, both sort of verbal and in the chat. Um, Teresa sort of gave you a pretty good overview of this opportunity. Um, I want to make it very clear, uh, Brad Calvert, Director of Regional Planning and Development at Dr. Cog is not an expert uh, on this topic, but um, we are, we as Dr. Cog are at least working from the assumption that we will actually be the applicant uh, for a regional uh, planning grant uh, under this opportunity, just given that we have a fair amount of experience as sort of I described uh, above uh, previously sort of supporting uh, emerging and mature uh, collaborative. So as Teresa mentioned, I, I literally just kind of went through the grant and from a grant writer's perspective, sort of made sort of a few notes. Um, I'm convinced the content uh, will come out of uh, the stakeholders that come together uh, and ultimately develop a proposal. Uh, but from a sort of an early read um, of this from again, creating a compelling um, application, you know, I think one of the key things, and this is straight from uh, the RFA that you're seeing um, on the screen right now, is this idea of moving up multiple steps or rungs on the ladder. That, that's, that's an interesting sort of expectation. Um, and our hope here is that sort of a regional approach uh, to this work would allow uh, communities across the Denver region to be able to move up not just a, a single step, uh, but multiple steps. Uh, and as you can see, um, sort of the uh, italicized piece at the at the bottom, um, they do uh, want grant applications from throughout the front range. Uh, so I think a very important message from uh, the folks that have spoken with you today is this should not be thought of as superseding a local application. If there is something that you are looking at in your own community that you want to pursue, by all means, uh, please take a look at this opportunity and see if it works for your local community. This is in many ways to sort of build kind of that regional scaffolding to allow um, us to move up sort of as a, as a community, uh, a community of communities um, up the zero waste ladder. So please don't don't take uh, sort of our, our ask and maybe even a commitment of working with us to suggest that you shouldn't be working on uh, your own application. This is an exciting uh, opportunity uh, and one that as many people and communities as possible should try to take um, advantage of. Uh, next slide, Kate. 
Um, another thing that sort of just occurred to me and sort of work, looking through the, the RFA is this is not uh, some ginormous, impossible to complete multiple hundred page grant application. Like just doing the math suggests that we're talking about 10 pages total uh, for narrative. Um, so that, that is not, uh, uh, not insignificant to get there um, uh, because we should all be on the same page. Uh, but from an overall sort of a work programs perspective in terms of coming up with a compelling narrative between now and, and August, uh, that seems uh, pretty doable compared to other uh, grant opportunities I've chased uh, over the years. Um, one thing that I noticed is this idea of sort of a singular project goal. Um, and that's one that for kind of a collaborative uh, might be something that we have to spend some time thinking about. Uh, a single community that's trying to move up a rung or two rungs can pretty easily get to something that feels like a really uh, sort of coalesce, coalesced statement or cohesive statement around what your project goal is. For us, that might take a little bit of massaging to make sure that we all feel uh, pretty good about this. Uh, the other thing that's really important is this is just the first round of funding. Like we, we do not have to feel like this has to be the end-all be-all and, and, and ultimately bring forward a solution set. Uh, to sort of every waste shed issue that the region uh, might be facing. There, there are other uh, opportunities uh, coming up in, in, in the future. That doesn't mean we should not use this opportunity to set ourselves up for success uh, when future opportunities uh, come around um, as well. And then just sort of an important note, um, Teresa even sort of pointed to some of this in terms of the, the eligible applicants. Um, it wasn't lost on me uh, that they very specifically called out intergovernmental partnerships. Um, I think at minimum, we can, we can call this emerging coalition um, that for sure. Uh, and the fact that they had enough foresight to ultimately name that as an eligible applicant suggests that the funder recognizes the value of communities uh, working together uh, with, with uh, other communities as well as uh, other partners uh, as well. So that, that's, that's all good news. Um, it's ultimately um, suggesting that um, convincing uh, sort of the funder here that we are looking to pursue kind of a regional approach to me suggests um, that we are already past that initial sort of um, process to, to plant that seed and to recognize the value of a, of a regional uh, approach. Next slide, Kate. And then just in terms of sort of project reach and goals, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of the, the, the roles that lead us to a successful uh, application, but I wanna point to some things that are also included within the RFA um, itself. Um, it's, you know, they, they want to understand what communities are going to be uh, served uh, by this, um, but it's important to know that, you know, from our, you can make a case that, uh, Everyone in Dr. Cox's planning area sort of by reference is, is ultimately uh, an included uh, community, but this, this application would be strengthened with more uh, specific commitments. So that, that's something to think about, um, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about that um, coming up as well. Um, in terms of uh, sort of the application, uh, it would ultimately benefit from sort of how the project will advance those existing local goals. Uh, that's where these sort of letters of support and commitment are really important here um, to, to be able to describe with some degree of, if not certainty, um, some level of commitment about using the work that would come out of, of this proposal to, to ultimately advance not only regional waste diversion goals, but, but moving individual communities up uh, their own uh, waste ladder um, as well. Uh, we also need to be thinking about uh, roles for community and business partners, um, both during the grant period uh, and beyond, something we'll just need to reflect uh, in the application and kind of related to that as well as, um, you know, Teresa mentioned that this is sort of a two-year uh, sort of window for the project, but uh, a successful application really is going to sort of extend um, that beyond uh, the grant period uh, as well. Uh, next slide. And I know there's a question coming in from Suzanne, but we may sort of save that uh, uh, towards uh, the end here. So let me just sort of finish up with a few more uh, slides. Um, just sort of getting back to kind of actually the, the business of actually putting hopefully a successful uh, grant application uh, together. Um, as noted, it's due on the 10th of August. Uh, so that is not a uh, not a, not a, not a, not exactly the longest window, but but pretty reasonable um, considering 
uh, the sort of the reality that really there isn't necessarily a huge application um, that has to be put together, but obviously some a lot of thought uh, needs to needs to happen. So really, kind of the first part of July is working um, with folks on this call, whoever's willing. Uh, to sort of step up and get involved to, to make sure that that scope of work is feeling like it's going to work for uh, your individual needs, the needs of your community. Um, obviously, that then sort of turns into kind of a refined budget and really a, a phase in kind of that late July, um, early August to sort of collect uh, those letters of support. Um, and as noted uh, previously, really, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced those letters are a way to show the strength of this collaborative. So that will really will be an important part uh, sort of this grant, uh, grant application uh, process. Uh, in terms of time commitment, I'll describe kind of some roles um, here in a second. We really think this can be relatively minimal over the next maybe six, seven, eight weeks. Um, a few online meetings uh, to, to maybe get us started in addition to the conversation that happened in January, um, the follow-up survey today's conversation, just to make sure we are uh, really have a strong proposal uh, from outlined uh, to begin with. And then, you know, obviously, if you've ever been through something like this, um, reviewing drafts um, outside of meetings is important so that when we have our time together, uh, you feel like you're representing your community, your department, and have a sense of, of how to maybe steer uh, the proposal in a direction that, that works better for you. And then again, I sort of hammered this, but I'll do it one more time. Um, those letters of support are really going to be um, pretty important uh, for, again, a successful uh, application that is attempting to sort of meet the needs of, of a pretty broad and diverse uh, collaborative. Uh, next slide. Uh, so again, just a few, uh, a little bit of a sense of kind of roles that would be super helpful. Um, as again, um, I am making the commitment that, and it's sort of the last sort of bullet on here, um, Dr. Cogstaff is more than willing to sort of take this thing to the finish line, uh, uh, making sure all the materials are complete um, and that we have a compelling application, but we are very much in the uh, grant writing expertise role, not the subject matter expertise role. So we do really do need a good cadre of, of uh, partners here to ultimately get us to um, kind of the best uh, version of this proposal. So on the sort of the lighter lift side, we would love to have folks that are kind of in that advisory role. Uh, maybe you're simply kind of committing to two things. One read through uh, to make sure that you can sort of do a head nod that this is something that will be of value. Uh, to your community is that pretty far, um, is it, you know, near near final, um, and then obviously again sort of that letter of support uh, phase, which you know for all intents and purposes to have uh, something in the door by August 10th, we we'll probably have to close um, the letter receipt, the receiving letters by like that Wednesday before, which is Wednesday August 5th. If they trickle in, they trickle in, but if if we can get most of them in the door by that Wednesday, that'd be great. Uh, and then kind of the the more um, the heavier lift would be to join um, sort of the core group of folks that is trying to put together uh, these application uh, materials. It would be a part of the project team that's defining uh, the scope, uh, helping sort of think through uh, the budget, um, uh, all those sorts of things. That could mean uh, sort of taking uh, the lead on one or more sections of the grant, whether that's timeline, scope of work. Uh, again, having lived through this multiple times, it's good to kind of have uh, folks that are taking on uh, really sort of key uh, sections and having some sort of autonomy to work uh, with other stakeholders to, to draft uh, those sections and then um, as sort of the lead uh, grant writer make sure that it's, it's all coming together into a final uh, and compelling um, application. Again, I wouldn't I wouldn't think of taking the lead of one of, on one or more sections. I wouldn't frankly let it freak you out. Uh, literally, I think the longest section is like three pages. Um, it, it is not. Uh, it is not a lot of uh, material to, to to produce. Obviously, that doesn't mean that it doesn't take thoughtful conversation um, to get there. And then again, um, sort of Kate and my role is to convene uh, some of these conversations over the next uh, few weeks, uh, but really to do um, sort of again that final application packet, uh, put it together, and ultimately be uh, sort of the applicant of record. Um, it is my intent that that's what we will be doing. I do need one more sign off um, from our finance folks that everything looks good on, on their end to be uh, the named applicant here. I, much like Teresa, didn't see anything that raised a major red flag um, related to match and, and other obligations that, that would ultimately have my finance folks a little nervous about this. It seemed pretty straightforward. So I, I hope that is uh, a pretty easy uh, hurdle um, to get over. Uh, so with that, maybe the next slide. And I don't, does 
does someone else maybe want to take a crack at um, this, the question that Suzanne asked uh, in, the, in the chat? I, I feel like I have subject matter experts I should lean in rather, rather than trying to answer that myself. So if Teresa, Megan, Jonathan, you might want to take a swing at that. Teresa, do you want to go first? Or? Sure, sure. Okay. So um, absolutely, like that is the million dollar question. So I don't know that it would be $450,000. I think um, what we would want to do is collect some interest from different contractors and uh, further really define the scope of work. And so the contractors um, that we're envisioning are data collection consultants, you know, folks that are familiar with the, the Colorado industry and can help us kind of pull some of these, these numbers together. Um, you know, it we would have to kind of refine a budget. And um, so I don't know quite what the total grant would be. I think others that that kind of want to jump in, but um, I, I think what the funds would be spent on would be a consultant um, to be a, a kind of um, administered at the direction of COG and the rest of the steering committee, which would be made up of folks that want to kind of join us. Um, you know, in, in this grant application. Right. And I mean, that's why we want to have a core group of people come together and help us refine the scope. Like we have ideas, right? But that doesn't mean it's going to align with our entire 50 some plus local governments, right? That are part of the COG. So a couple things that we've identified that I think are pretty important, like we've come back to is probably identifying data, right? Like trying to figure out on a local government level up to the entire region, what does our materials management look like? What do the materials look like? Where are the materials going? And where could they go? And what should we try to target first? You know, I think that's kind of one of the main priorities that we have for here, but we have a lot of other ideas, but we want, really wanna bounce them, I think, off of other folks on this call to make sure that it's holistic and it represents, you know, all the jurisdictions, whether you're a city or a county government. I would just add one quick other thing, and which is, you know, for Suzanne, EcoCycle's been an awesome partner for us, even though we're not in Boulder County. Kate Bailey has awesome ideas. You've got a, a great, you know, kind of vision for that group and a work plan. And I know that data is is something that's needed for, for EcoCycle as well. So we'd love to have partners um, just like you guys. And, and I'll just add quickly, I mean, you know, the budget of the proposal depends on the proposal, uh, and obviously, to, to both Teresa and Megan's good points, we'll we'll know more about that over the next few weeks. Um, but the, it's it's no accident that we asked this group specifically about the the term obstacles. Uh, that is something that the RFA makes very clear. They want they want grant recipients to have a pretty good understanding of what they're trying to overcome uh, to be able to sort of move up uh, a rung or two. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons we asked that question in today's setting was to just begin to have a handle uh, on that so that as we begin to sort of craft a narrative and, and project proposal, we we have uh, that in mind as well as sort of the, the additional details uh, that will come out of um, kind of a core group getting together to talk a little bit more about this. So I'm sure everybody kind of saw uh, the slide, uh, the, the polling slide that's, that's up on uh, the screen. Uh, we would love to have some folks uh, jump in here. Again, I, I don't want to tell you it's no commitment, uh, but I also don't want you to be scared away. Um, it's just the reality of kind of what maybe your July and first week of August uh, is looking like. Uh, again, kind of that core group would be working um, with the folks that have already been engaged uh, to really sort of think through in detail um, a project proposal, including work plan uh, and budget. Uh, if you're interested in the, in the advisory committee, that, that really kind of means uh, maybe kind of a, a once a one pass uh, towards the end just to make sure that it's feeling like it's meeting uh, your needs. And if you have to think about it, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I, I, one of our core team has already said letters of support are non-negotiable. Uh, <laughs> we really think that is the thing that is going to set us apart. Again, it's, it's hard to talk about a regional collaborative, that, that alone um, advancing sort of regional data and other conversations. I, I think there's merit and there's value there. Uh, but the extent to which uh, local communities can turn uh, that data and information um, into tools that they use up, they use to move up the zero waste ladder, that's the, that's the message that we're going to have to deliver uh, to the funder. And given that we have very little 
space within the narrative to make that case those letters are going to be really critical. Um, sometimes in grant applications, letters of support are probably more cosmetic than anything. I don't think that's the case here. I think really good letters are going to be the thing that sets uh, this apart from um, other worthy projects that are also uh, looking to receive an investment. So it looks like we've got some volunteers, uh, which is great. And I saw maybe a few others uh, in the chat uh, as well. We would love to have a, a really good team uh, working on this so that, again, we can ultimately uh, develop a product that's helpful for all the communities in the Denver region. Brad, this is Nancy Ford again. How many people uh, would uh, be beneficial for the core group? Uh, have, have, you know, uh, you've done this before, so what would be a good number for that core group? Anything in that sort of eight to 12 range feels good. Um, you know, you want, you want a diversity perspective, but you don't want to be burdened by uh, too many, I mean, if nothing else for scheduling, like just trying to schedule a meeting in these times with 20 people alone uh, creates some, 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 some trouble. Uh, so anything in that eight to 12, particularly if it feels like it's representative of the communities, um, you know, Teresa's questions about where you are on the ladder, um, even sort of um, current uh, uh, services versus sort of what you're aspiring to be. Like as long as we feel like we have pretty good diversity, uh, in terms of the core group, in terms of what the perspectives they're bringing forward, you know, anything in that eight to twelve range feels good to me. So very and good. and we're um, we we still haven't set settled on what exactly we're looking to accomplish with this grant. Correct. I, mean, I think you know we I think there's a sense out there um, based on the January conversation, the February, I mean the January follow up a little bit with today's conversation and frankly where uh, the grant funds are ultimately taking us in terms of a proposal uh, but we very much want the people that are involved in the core group uh, as well as this this group to really drive uh, the final proposal uh, including work plan uh, budget and all those sorts of details okay i mean bottom line if we aren't meeting the needs of the people on this call uh, then we don't have a very good project Right, and I would echo that as well. Um, this this effort isn't about spending money for the sake of spending money. It's very specific, and we would love to include your organization's needs as well. You know, and if you join the core group, it's an opportunity to get some some of those needs met. You know, with with uh, helping us refine the scope of work for this project. I think I'll just add, you know, the state's pretty much said that in general, communities or regions that do have plans in place, especially region plans, generally get, you know, higher rankings, you know, among state grants. We don't know exactly how the forward board will, you know, award grants, but that's particularly how the PPAB assistant committee, assistance committee has been. So another thing, it could that by just us putting up together a plan, like, it might actually help your community get funds in the future or this region, frankly, get more grant funds in the future if that's how we decide to proceed. Do, do we have a plan for this region? I know that the governor, you know, has a, a, a plan uh, for energy, but do we have a, a waste diversion plan for the region? I'm sorry, I'm a little, uh, uh, you know, ignorant if you will of of what we're doing and randy mormon from ecocycle kate kate bailey was the one that really helped us tremendously randy mormon is on our arvada sustainability advisory committee and i know that you know they have a lot of answers but i don't what what has dr cog done in terms of a regional plan uh, on this topic yeah, next on to, waste next, diversion. Next, next to nothing. That, that this is, I mean, we're dipping our sort of toe in the water here. Uh, but again, I don't even necessarily think of this as a Dr. Cog product at this point, per se, other than we would be the lead applicant and bring people together. Um, one of the things that this, this, this opportunity would allow is a larger conversation about governance uh, related to re regional waste shed planning uh, in the future. Um, so if, if we are going to ultimately come up with something that does feel uh, like a regional uh, waste diversion plan uh, for the Denver region, 
this this is the starting point for that conversation and, and, I, and I think how far we get in that conversation over two years uh, there's probably any number of, of variables but, but as I sort of alluded to and kind of uh, a grant writers review of the proposal we're going to have to send some pretty strong signals about what the work is and let's call it year three four and five not years years one and two uh, they would ultimately be seeking uh, funding through this through this work so I, I think we are very much heading towards a plan but I'm, I'm a very big believer that the owner uh, of that plan and who puts that plan um, into action needs to be known and our hope is that that's maybe something that comes out of this uh, two-year conversation as well. Right, and just to piggyback on that, so for those of you that maybe couldn't join us in January, you know, um, Dr. Cog's boundary roughly encapsulates about 50% of the state's population. Um, so therefore we can assume it probably encapsulates at least 50% of what the state's waste generated is. Um, and, you know, there are other parts of the state that have done regional planning, and other parts of the country, right? Larimer County is a great example here in Colorado, but the difference is that they have a county that houses all those local governments, right? We don't necessarily have that here in the metro area. You know, we have however many, like Brad, correct me, how many counties, is it six, is it six counties in the Dr. Cog boundary? Uh, nine and a portion of a 10th. Okay, nine and a portion of a 10th. And then, you know, several other dozen uh, municipal governments. And so, our thought by collaborating with Dr. Cog, since they are already a regional entity, you know, they already help with regional planning, they'd be the best entity to help us drive this mission forward since we don't have a governing entity other than Dr. Cog that really encapsulates all of us. Hey, um, this is Suzanne. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hey, Suzanne. Okay, great. I'm not on the, the audio. Um, I, well, so on behalf of EcoCycle um, and a formal elected official from this region, um, I just want to thank Dr. Cog for stepping up and convening this conversation. I think it's really important. I think as a region, the Front Range has, there's a real, well, we have an imperative to do better and we have real opportunities there. And um, I guess EcoCycle's kind of role has been to work with communities um, to help them, like Arvada, um, take the next steps. and. We are uh, interested in hearing more about this effort and how we might fit in. One of the things that we did for Boulder County recently was to do a zero waste assessment of all the communities in the county um, to figure out how they were doing, where they were, um, and what next steps would be most useful, uh, whether it's looking at the diversion potential or the greenhouse gas potential, um, which are two primary drivers in, in Boulder County. So anyhow, um, I think I'm glad you guys are having this conversation and happy to participate and try to, as, as things come together, to kind of figure out whether and if we fit into helping to, to move the region forward. Thanks, Suzanne. We won't, we won't be shy about asking, I'm sure. This is Jonathan in Lakewood. Um, for those on the call that maybe were answer indicated they were like a little bit you know lower down on the on the ladders just starting to climb um you know trying to wrap their head around why this would benefit them are there any concerns or questions or um i guess i'm just trying to find out where where all of the communities are in terms of seeing how this might benefit them or what they'd hope to get out of it is there any any feedback from any anybody on the call on that front Feel free to uh, type the chat or unmute yourself and reveal yourself on camera. If you... <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, answer the question, Nancy Ford again. Um, I was I was asked to be on on this. Randy asked me to be a participant, and I certainly, um, while I absolutely want to see my community do better in its diversion rate, I also think that we need a regional plan um, I because it seems to me we're very uncoordinated. You know, we have all these different municipalities doing their thing, basically. And um, I also would like to be involved in some type of a situation where we can foster 
uh, businesses in this area because I, I do think smaller businesses are important. Uh, so, for example, in Arvada, we have a, a, a group called Sustainability. It's a wonderful uh, little group that they are made up of people who have disabilities. They're able to recycle certain items that the larger haulers can't, and to be able to collaborate with a business like that and maybe help foster other businesses. Um, I, I, you know, for me, there's just a real lack of education. And having just gone through what we went through, you can see this uh, by the responses that you get. Uh, you know, people don't really believe that recycling is taking place. Uh, there's just a lot of work to be done in this area. And that's why I'm here today. I'd, I'd like to get involved in some way that's meaningful and that we can kind of get this needle moving a little bit because we are really backwards, uh, I think, in this area. Um, and and I will say compared to Fort Collins and what Fort Collins has, um, we have very little. I mean, I think about all the drop-offs that Fort Collins has where people can go and recycle, even if they're not part of a system. We have nothing like that in Arvada. And, and, and I cringe every time I hear people, my constituents say, well, I, I, I drop my stuff off in Westminster. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Westminster's paying for that, you know. So we, we really do have a very strong need down here for, for um, opportunities. And I, I don't, I'm not really sure where I fit in into this group, but I definitely am interested in being a participant. I think we can uh, close the poll. And I'm going to add this a few uh, uh, steps uh, related to the volunteer income in as well. So um, with that, we've got like maybe six minutes left. So I'm, I'm We'll open the floor for any, Jonathan sort of uh, started with this already, but like any big picture thoughts that folks have about um, wanting to be involved, moving forward, concerns uh, that you might have uh, about moving forward with a regional application. Um, happy to work with us now, either verbally, uh, you can unmute yourself or, or through the chat, and we can take a look and, and respond uh, in the group if you see anything that's probably speak to. Hi, this is Elizabeth from Littleton. Um, hey, Elizabeth. Hey. So we had a talk internally a couple days ago with the director of public works and director of community development. And um, based on where the city's resource and staffing levels are at right now, um, to answer the previous question about what's going to be of most use, I think, I think given the political bent of this community, data uh, is going to be really important for Littleton to start uh, being able to be somewhere higher up the rungs on the ladder and not just looking up the ladder. <laughs> um, uh, we've got a current city council that is um, very responsive to data um, and and is is very excited about making clear-eyed decisions based on um you know well-informed conversations and i think the city of littleton has got nothing uh at, at our city level from a data perspective where we could start to have those conversations between staff and the elected officials and the city and the community about the reality of of our our you know solid waste management world down here so i think the data part could be really important <clears throat> for littleton to be able to to make some changes <coughs> um so yeah i just wanted to throw my hat in the mix regarding the need for data awesome thanks Thank for time you. in 
other questions, concerns, comments? I think just hearing um, Nancy and, and Elizabeth that um, it, it's, you know, I think community, we have not been successful in really taking many steps to move up the ladder and we've been focused on ways for a long time. And what it's clear to me that when a statistically significant survey says that 97% of your community thinks recycling is important, but there's not enough support to invest dollars or political will to change a system that you obviously have a gap. What is that gap? Do we need better infrastructure to bring prices down? Do we need different facilities to make, make it easier for people to access these things? If it's about government role, then how do we help the actual market function better so that people can keep the choice of hauler? Maybe we don't solve our traffic and nuisance issues, but we can get better services and actually require some things in licensing without spiking people's prices and having that political fallout. So there's, it's to me, there's just clearly a gap. And these, to address that, seems like it's a regional effort because it's about shared facilities and transportation costs and all these things. So I think to me, that's where this seems like an obvious win for any community getting involved because um, regardless of whether you are in control or have a community that really is hands off with the waste issues, we can hopefully move the needle. That's my hope. You know, Jonathan, I, I think the thing that really uh, stands out for me, having just gone through this, is the attitude of choice, my right. Um, I really struggled with that because I think that when people feel that it's an individual choice, they don't see this as a community thing. Um, that this is we're this is for the common good, the betterment of all of us, and um, I don't feel that we've made the case yet for that, um, especially in Colorado where our tipping fees are so cheap and it's so easy to throw out, and and I think the convenience is extremely important. Um, I'm a marketing researcher. I've done a lot of research in the green movement, if you will. So historically, people will always say that they want to do what's right. But given, you know, costs and other factors, uh, just because they, you know, they're always going to say what they feel that they should say. But that doesn't mean that ultimately they're going to do it. And I think that when people truly understand the need, and, you know, we struggle with that. And I think, um, Elizabeth, I think that's who's uh, from Le uh, Littleton, you know, that, um, that data to, to help people to understand, because otherwise it's sort of like that, the, the um, um, oh, um, you know, the, um, sorry, the climate, you know, you have, People on different sides of the camp, you know, who will say, no, there's no such thing as climate change or yes, there is climate change. We really don't have those hard facts. And I, and I think, you know, that data will help. But again, how do you move the needle on this individualism that we have where it's my right to choose my hauler? Forget about the... Forget about the community. To, to me, that's an attitude that somehow we fostered. And it's even in our constitution, which really annoys me, that a community cannot force citizens to, you know, to, to go with one hauler or another, that people still have a right to choose their hauler. And I think that's a real problem. Nancy, did you sign up to be part of the core group? Did I? Yeah. Um, I think she just did. Yeah, that's sort of what I was confirming. I would be, I'd be more than happy to be a part of the core okay. group. <laughs> right. I, I'm, reading a, I'm reading a very interesting book, too. I, I just want to say this. It's called Fashionopolis, and it's... Um, it's about the fashion industry, which I have a lot of knowledge on. And 
it, it was interesting. I just read this one chapter where they were talking about cost and getting the textile and apparel industry to move the needle. And even where they can show that it's cheaper sometimes, companies will still not go with it. And so um, uh, there's a there's some kind of a sticking point uh, with this whole thing when it comes to the environment. But but uh, it, it's it's really interesting because I, I just want you to know it made a really big impression on me. I mean, I got to the point where I was so sick and tired of hearing about people's choice and their rights. And um, we, we, we've got to somehow help people to recognize that it really is a, this is a community thing. It's not about individualism and, and choice. It's about the community. What's best for our world uh, that we live in? I think that is a good way to bring us home. Uh, so with that, uh, unless, I mean, obviously, Teresa, Megan, Kate, and Jonathan, if you want to chime in, feel, please uh, feel free to do so. I just, I just want this group to know uh, that you will probably hear from us again in the not too distant future, mostly to kind of just do some follow-up uh, type things. Uh, I've seen some some folks indicate uh, their interest in, in core group or advisor group in the chat, and so obviously we know that, but we will uh, follow up uh, with everyone that received this invite just to make sure that we have uh, kind of our teams uh, put together. And then, as I mentioned kind of earlier in the call, we did have uh, some interest uh, from many people to view this later. Uh, so we will certainly send out a note to a pretty large list just to know, fo let folks know uh, that the recording is available um, so that they can catch up and hopefully uh, join us uh, in the conversation as well. Um, please don't think that just because maybe you aren't necessarily formally involved in that core group or the sort of advisory uh, committee that you won't hear from us. Uh, we will not uh, sort of overwhelm you uh, with information, but we are ultimately uh, marching towards uh, a grant application that is designed to benefit everyone on this call and even folks that are not on this call. So we feel like it's sort of our duty uh, to keep you informed uh, as to how the, um, the application is shaping up. And obviously once we uh, submit something, uh, we would want everyone on this call to be informed of that as well as um, any future uh, funding decision to advance the conversation that we've obviously been having uh, for the past half a year, if not longer. Um, so with that, I want to give Teresa, Megan, Jonathan, Kate, any need for a last word, or you feel like we can sign off? We can sign off. Thank you right. very much. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. Everybody enjoy uh, the upcoming holiday weekend and talk soon. Bye. Thanks, Thank bye. You. Thank you. Thank you.